give it a second to let some people get settled in and find seats. Okay, so for those of you that just came in, um, maybe I should also introduce myself because some of you may have absolutely no idea who I am. I'm Nathan Hayden. I've been a parishioner of this church for about over three years now. And uh, uh, Suzanne and Evan know that I love teaching and that I love teaching about spirituality, worship, things like that. And so I was asked, uh, because Evan is away, or elsewhere. Um, I was asked uh, to maybe pitch in this Sunday and teach about something that I know a little bit about, which is a particular type of sacred art uh, called uh, iconography, icons. Icons are a very prevalent um, uh, type of, of a tool used in worship, uh, particularly in the Eastern Orthodox Church. You do see uh, icons uh, in other places, though, other churches, um, but the Eastern Orthodox kind of have a handle on it. It's kind of their thing. Um, but the Western church um, has its own expressions of worship and other types of sacred art as well. Um, so I kind of would like to just get a sense from you all before we start getting and digging in into this topic. Um, what sort of things aid you in your own worship? What sort of things, you know, like in a church service, what are the things that draw your attention um, and maybe help you or help give you perspective or give you a particular type of experience when it comes to worship in a church? Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, so go ahead and let's hear some responses. Okay, absolutely, great. So, you know, hymns, particularly older ones, ones that you know, a lot of people will know that people can join in, it creates like a communal experience to be able to do that. Absolutely, Good, a great answer. Yeah. The interior architecture of the church is Absolutely. Okay, yeah, so the interior architecture and the art inside the church. Um, I can say personally that, especially during the Eucharist here, I'm drawn to the stained glass image of Christ at the, uh, like, up on top of the altar. That is where a lot of my attention is drawn to. Absolutely. Candles, okay. Can you say more about, about candles? Okay. Candles. <laughs> okay, yeah, great. Okay, candles, absolutely. Candles, uh, almost so many churches have them. Do, doesn't matter whether it's a liturgical church or whether it's some other type of church. Uh, candles tend to be fairly ubiquitous in terms of Christian worship. Uh, they represent... Uh, the light, they represent the divinity of Christ? Absolutely. Um, how many of you maybe personally or alongside uh, Richard, how many of you um, actively incorporate the idea of images into maybe personal devotion or maybe devotion within a church service? How many, how many of you maybe consciously choose to do that or maybe subconsciously choose to do that? 
Uh huh. Yeah. I do find that statuary, large or small, mm -hmm. is very helpful uh, in uh, turning my focus to where I want to go. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So statuary, maybe statues of the saints, or of, of is there a particular uh, person that you think of when you think of a statue that 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 kind of draws your attention? Uh, who uh, who would that be? Okay, the Virgin Mary, absolutely, absolutely. And so it will be very common for uh, churches, maybe they have a statue of the Virgin Mary, and it'll be considered what's called a station. And they will, on a feast of the Virgin Mary, they'll make a procession and go to that statue, and they'll say a prayer uh, uh, in front of that statue that may be for the Virgin Mary. Okay, and that's really good. Um, that's really good for maybe segueing into the next part of this conversation, which is somewhat of the troubled history that icons have presented or sacred art in general has presented in the church throughout history. Um, it may not come as a shock to any of you that there have been a lot of people who have not liked to see any images at all, representations of saints, representations of God, representations of the Virgin Mary, um, in parts of, of the early church, um, it may have not been entirely uncommon for a particularly zealous uh, monastery uh, to be hired out by someone else to go to another town and uh, find uh, sacred images and destroy them. Um, it was a very... Uh, um, the use of images in worship has had a very conflicted history, and it still has that, uh, that uh, tension now, too. And there's a lot of good reason for that, because uh, my uh, mother's family, uh, they are devoutly Roman Catholic, but they are uh, at least, um, you know, at least a, a, you know, from like a few decades ago, they would get lobbed at them consistently that they worship the saints, that they, you know, worship statues, that they worship these images. And so there is a very nuanced difference in the way that these images are treated. Um, it is, and that is something that the church spent a lot of time trying to work out. And it took centuries to kind of get to that point. And even after the church came to a, what would co could be considered a consensus about how these things are treated, um, there is still, uh, you know, maybe some, some issues at hand in terms of the way images are considered. Um, so what I think I'll do now is, as I'm talking about these things, I have some icons from my own uh, personal collection that I thought I would pass around and maybe show you. Um, so I have a, a few uh, examples of some icons that kind of show some of the breadth in which um, the Eastern Orthodox um, approach this uh, sacred art form and the things that they do with it. This first one is of basically uh, creation, as discussed in, in, uh, in the early chapters of Genesis. And what will be interesting to note is that when you see this, you see an image of Jesus Christ, uh, who is uh, participating, basically the one orchestrating creation. And there is a very good reason for that. Um, this is kind of getting into some more complicated theological waters, but the idea is that even though Jesus was born in a particular time in history as the Son of God, is the idea that the Son of God always existed. And the scriptures say that everything was created, you know, through him. And so because of that, um, iconographers have a sense of freedom to be able to say, okay, even though Jesus was not technically born at the time of the creation of the world, the Son of God was still present and still active in, in, um, in the act of creation. And so this is what's being depicted here. So this is from, um, I believe this will be from a Greek monastery. So I'll just start this here.
This next icon is of Christ, and this is uh, an icon that is called Extreme Humility. And this is essentially, um, this is post-crucifixion. He's being laid in a tomb. And you'll notice that here is the spear that pierced him. This is the sponge uh, that was uh, given to his lips, um, you know, to, uh, you know, to try to uh, quench his thirst. And, and you'll notice that as he is being sort of laid in this tomb, it's called extreme humility for, for a specific reason. Because uh, when you notice his hands, his hands are depicted in a manner like this in a manner that suggests that he is bound by chains, by cuffs, something like that. But as you'll notice, there are no cuffs or chains around him. And the idea that's being shown here is that he has uh, willingly endured it uh, for everyone else. So I'll start this at this table. Okay. Yeah. So do we have the microphone? or? Okay, 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 so you want to know what Eastern Orthodox is. Okay, okay, that's a fair question. Okay, it's okay, it's okay. Uh, so the question was, what is Eastern Orthodox? Um, Eastern Orthodox is a specific, um, it's kind of complicated to talk about, but essentially um, you would have the early church, uh, which, you know, would, be have, would have been considered one holy Catholic apostolic, but because of cultural differences, differences in time, uh, the way that, you know, things expand and change, um, you have these regional aspects that develop. And so um, if you go to a Roman Catholic church, um, worship will look very different. If you go to an Eastern Orthodox church, it'll look very different. Eastern Orthodoxy, for better or worse, tends to be connected to ethnicity, like Russian or Greek or um, Armenian, things like that. Uh -huh. And calendar. And calendar, exactly. That's actually pretty significant, the calendar. Exactly, the calendar can be very different too. Um, there are many Orthodox that follow the same calendar as we do. For example, tomorrow, January 6th, is the Epiphany. And so there are many churches, Orthodox, uh, Eastern Orthodox and Western, that uh, follow the same uh, schedule of feasts such as Christmas and Epiphany. There are some churches, though, that are Orthodox, that follow a different calendar, where tomorrow, for them, instead of the Epiphany, they celebrate Christmas. And also, Easter tends to be a very different, uh, it can fluctuate as well. Uh, sometimes Eastern Orthodox and Western Easter line up on the same Sunday. Sometimes it could be a week apart, sometimes maybe a bit more than that. Um, they follow, uh, the, the issues of calendars still kind of go over my head because it is a very complex issue, um, but um, suffice to say, they have a very different sense of piety, very different sense of worship. Um, incense is used um, regularly at every service, and there's clouds of it to the point where um, sometimes you can't see anything else. Um, they, churches are surrounded by the images that I'm passing around right now. The vestments tend to look very different. They look almost more imperial because they tend to stem from um, the, what might be considered the Byzantine Empire. And so uh, people that would uh, have like been active in the imperial court, the dress that you would have seen at that point in time um, in the early Eastern Roman Empire, um, that sort of um, aesthetic in terms of what they, the garb that they wear then, you see semblance of that now in terms of what a bishop wears, what the priest wears, things like that. Uh -huh. <clears throat> you mentioned that there's one issue that was controversial regarding iconistic uh, use. Um, and you mentioned because of the idolatry related possibility. Still not? <clears throat> I think you didn't mention also um, remnants. So in the Middle Ages, especially, they sold salvation with remnants, which is a form of iconistic. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah. So um, uh, relics, you know, the idea of like, um, you know, relics of saints, things like that. Sometimes they could be used as a sense of currency. 
um, if you were able to make a pro, uh, pilgrimage and uh, do a devotion in front of a relic that could have some spiritual benefit for you. Some people might uh, argue against the efficacy of that. Some people might think that there are inherent issues to doing things like that. But that is another very important part of, of um, spiritual devotion. And it is, in many ways, very um, analogous to the idea of icons that we're thinking about with today. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great, uh, great comment for that. Um, OK, I have a few more icons that I'll pass around. OK. So this is of a Russian saint, Saint Seraphim of Sarov. Uh, he's actually a fairly modern saint. Um, I think from the 18th century, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, and he was a monastic of a monastery in Russia and decided to become a hermit. And it is said that after his time in the wilderness and being a hermit, that he started to experience what's called um, in a, again, this is another kind of technical term, but he was emblematic of the idea of what's called theosis. Theosis uh, comes from a Greek word, a Greek word that's related to God, and theosis is a process in which you have rid yourself of yourself to such an extent that there's more room for God to shine through in you. And kind of like when Moses is coming down the mountain and he's glowing because he had been in God's presence, that is similar to what Seraphim um, is uh, said to have experienced as well, that he would just kind of start glowing because he was in a particular spiritual place where you know, God was much more present in him than maybe he was himself. It's kind of difficult to explain, but uh, the idea of theosis is a very important idea in a lot of Eastern Orthodox theology, and to such an extent that they say that that is really the goal of every Christian, whether we experience it now um, or um, in the afterlife, that we are intended to become this, this like divinized person. Um, and that's exactly what the incarnation was setting us up for. So um, I'll go ahead and pass this around. I'll start this at this table here. Okay, this next one is um, actually really, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Appropriate, uh, because we are at the very last day of Christmas in terms of the Christmas season today. And this is an icon of the birth of Jesus Christ. And this is another uh, Russian icon. And you'll see that um, this is what's called a triptych, meaning that there are three panels to it. And in the middle, you have um, basically the angels uh, up above praising God, uh, praising you know, the birth of Christ. You have Mary, you have Joseph. Um, the star is up above, and it's already indicating the Magi present. And then you have flanked on either side. You have Archa the Archangel Michael and the Archangel Gabriel. And then there's a bunch of uh, Russian writing on the back of it that I'm not very good at reading. So, but I'll go ahead and maybe start this. So, I'll start this on this table here. I have two more here. This is an icon that was actually a gift to me um, this past year. And this is an example of a very modern type of iconography. Uh, this is from a Ukrainian uh, iconographer, Ivanka Demchik, and this is an image of the resurrection. And this is a really good example of a sense of minimalism that a lot of modern iconography tends to use. Um, and, and so I'll say a little bit more about that because 
it is easy to kind of give the impression that iconography is more about, about the artist or maybe about artistic talent. Um, and that's not necessarily the case. Um, how about, I'll put this here. And And finally, this is an icon that I produced myself in a, in a workshop. And this is of the prophet Elijah in the desert, uh, waiting in a cave, waiting. Um, basically, this is where a crow or a raven um, uh, you know, comes to give him you know, sustenance you know, and to assure him that everything will be fine. So um, this one took probably a few weeks to do, uh, just really kind of, not quite rushing through the process, but keeping a very strict schedule. Um, and it was um, a very eye-opening experience to be able to, you know, make one myself. So I'll uh, set this maybe back here. That's the only one that I've actually finished. I have another one that I've started. Um, but icons take a long time to, to work on, so. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Oh, so uh, she has a question? Who has a microphone? One of the things that really challenges me in my understanding of various icon mm -hmm. paintings is the symbolism. Absolutely, yes, I yes. I don't know what it means. And I kind of think that uh, a lot of the symbolism was used when literacy was not expected. And so, but, but did everybody that looked at these icons know what the symbolism meant? Was it that common of an understanding? You know, that is something, that is a very good question. And I think that there may be some sort of that may be a difficult question to answer because just like with anything, the, you are dealing with artists and you're dealing with the idea of spiritual inspiration in this. And so one of the things that I did want to talk about is that iconography is very strictly regulated as generally speaking. There are very strict uh, canons that iconographers need to follow in terms of the type of symbolism that's used the type of iconography that's used in an icon to try to convey an idea. The, for example, the one that's, that, I, that I did of the prophet Elijah, he has a scroll in his hand, and every prophet uh, in an icon will have a scroll in their hand, and that's how you know that it's a prophet. Um, Jesus, in certain uh, icons, um, will have a book of the Gospels open, and it may be pointed to a specific passage um, where... Um, the passage will be something like, I am the light of the world, and that is a very specific type of icon of Jesus. And then you may have another icon of Jesus open to another book of the Gospels where it might say something different. And those icons are intended to uh, not do different things, but to provide different perspectives. I think, do we have another question? Yeah. Or, I'm sorry, she, I'm sorry, she had the microphone. Okay, go ahead, I'm sorry. Where was the workshop you went to? It was actually local. Um, it was at St. Nicholas Antiochian Orthodox Church. And so there's an iconographer that lives in Austin, Texas, that comes up occasionally and leads these workshops. So why are the hands and arms always so proportion, out of proportion with the rest of these icons' bodies? They're so small. That is a good question. That is a good question. And that is where maybe some of the more artistic interpretation kind of comes in, and some theological significance too. Sometimes it's just an issue of maybe weird perspective that like icons are not necessarily beholden to have to follow particular proportions or ideas of, of, um, of uh, natural lighting, things like that, of shadows, um, because Icons are depicting something that is uh, mysterious, something that is transcendent, something that is in the heavens. And so sometimes uh, things are just um, maybe a little wonky in the way that they're depicted. 
Um, for example, my, my, my wife is not antagonistic at all about icons because she's married to me and she, that would be terrible if she hated icons, but sometimes she jokes around a little bit with them because in some icons, if an apostle might be looking upward, their neck might be at a weird 90 degree angle that is completely unnatural and it looks humorous. And the thing is though, is that the iconographer is not necessarily trying to depict something that is um, physiologically or biologically, you know, present or real. They're depicting something that is real, but something that transcends human experience. And so because of that, um, the hands might, you know, smaller hands might just be an attempt to minimize um, the, you know, the human nature in lieu of emphasizing the divinity that is coming out of the person. So um, that, that's a good question. And that may not be the most correct answer, but um, that is part of the methodology or a foundation of how icons are approached by particular painters. Um, but yeah, in thinking about, um, you know, as I was saying, icons follow a very specific, um, maybe that's not the right word, they, they, they kind of walk a tightrope in terms of the artist and in terms of what they're trying to convey. And so because of that, you kind of have this push and pull of this sense of inspiration of maybe doing something slightly different with it, but still working within the conventions of what's been said before. So, okay, I think it might be good to transition the talk to the next part, and that's to think about some of the framework for the way icons um, are thought of in, uh, theologically. Because, you know, icons in, a, in an Orthodox church are treated very differently. They are given a sort of reverence and veneration that might make people uncomfortable, and that could be understandable. Um, for example, if um, let's say it is the Orthodox equivalent of Good Friday, and this icon has been placed in the middle of an Orthodox uh, temple um, in front of the iconostasis where all the other icons are in front of that cover up where the altar is. Um, this would be placed on a particular stand, and you might walk up to it, and you do a very particular reverence um, in front of it. And not, maybe not every Orthodox Christian does this, and some churches have different ideas of it, but when you walk into a church and you see an icon like that and you're going to venerate it, what you would do is you make the sign of, sign of the cross in front of it, you would do this, and then you would do what's called a metony, or it, I think it's also called a, I'm going to butcher the Greek, like pros, proskunos, it, I'm, I'm not even going to try to say the Greek because I'm not going to get it right, but basically it is a prostration. And so you do the sign of the cross, and you might, you know, take your fingers and put them onto the ground as a way of, like, showing your humility in front of the image itself. And so you would do that once, you would do it again, and then you would kiss the icon in a certain place, and then you would make the sign of the cross and do that again. And so that type of response to an image, that is ultimately wood and paint. Um, you know, maybe there's, you know, egg in it, maybe there's certain oils, is a very natural product. And so to walk into a church and do something like that could be very problematic for some people. And that's understandable. But there is also a very um, developed foundation for thinking about how to approach an image like this when you walk into a church and venerate it. And so this is where we get to this right here. So Colossians 1.15 uh, says uh, in Greek, uh, which would be, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So um, the underlying words there in Greek uh, akon is icon. It's where we get the word icon. 
Icon means image. And so this is starting to get into some of the more uh, ideas of developed Christology in that when Jesus says, when you have seen me, you have seen the Father, this is what Paul is referencing um, in Colossians right here. And this isn't to say that... I was going to make another point, but that might just confuse things more, so forget I said that. Okay, strike that from the record. Okay, so, okay, let's just move on from that. So, this means that we have to think about what an image does, what an icon does, in terms of representation. When it comes to Jesus, Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus represents the invisible God, God the Father, okay? And basically, the idea is that when we have seen Jesus, we have seen the Trinity, because manifestations of God happen through the Spirit. Like, you can't take one without the other. All parts of the Trinity have to be present in that singular embodiment. And so when we have seen Christ, we have seen every aspect of that. So, this is sort of the subtext in which the idea of icons come from. However, this is where things start to get a little sticky, because does this suggest that an image like this, if this is an icon, does this mean that this is Saint Seraphim on a piece of wood? Does this mean that he is literally right in front of me? There's a temptation to try to say that in the way that icons are treated, in the way that theology of icons have developed, to say that, oh, we are actually committing idolatry because we think this is it itself. However, um, icon, in this particular sense, there is a bit more nuance to it. And I think one way of explaining that is to maybe think about the phones that we have in our pockets that have uh, tons, hundreds of little icons in there um, for apps that we all have. And so whenever I... Uh, you know, click onto like a, a, t a particular folder. Let's say I want to go to Twitter and I have like my little Twitter icon here. This icon of Twitter is not Twitter itself. It is something that gives me access to it. And so when I click on that, then now I am at Twitter, okay? And so one way we can think of icons like this is that it is not the thing itself but it is something that helps provide access. And it does that because it gives us a sense of immediacy. It can be similar to the idea of a picture of a loved one, although we don't normally do prostrations in front of images of uh, family members, but um, this is something similar to that. Um, an icon is something that provides us access. And because of that, they have been called by many um, as uh, windows to heaven. Because what they're trying to do is something akin to what Scripture does. Scripture is a written record of salvation history. There is human element, but it is also divinely inspired. And that is what we have with an icon as well. We have um, a, a moment in history that is being depicted. We have a person that was devoted to God, who is being portrayed for us. And we have not necessarily them in the image, but we have a way to consider them. And to be able to believe that, we have to have a mind that is geared towards a sacramental imagination. If we are taking the Eucharist and we are thinking, if we believe that there is a real presence of God in bread and wine, then we are also thinking that this can also take us to a mystical reality that is sort of hidden behind uh, the layers of, you know, paint here. So, this is a part of the controversy that raged for centuries in thinking about how do we treat these images? What are these images trying to do for us in terms of worship? Um, and so some people can be completely on board with Jesus as the image of the invisible God, but then when you put Jesus on, on a, a, when you depict him a certain way, 
and you treat that image a certain way, then things get a little weird. And so it wasn't until uh, the year 787. This is what was known as the last ecumenical council. Ecumenical councils are councils that were intended to be um, in, they, were, they were intended to involve the whole church. That's what ecumenical means. Ecumenical means like everything, everyone, um, the whole church. And so this was such a critical issue because um, the Eastern Orthodox particularly had such an attachment to these images, but there are people in the Eastern uh, Orthodox Church in that part of the empire that you know, thought they were very problematic, that they were given uh, to idolatry. And so it wasn't until the year 787 with the Seventh Ecumenical Council that a statement was officially produced to say icons are okay, and this is how we think of them. And so this is what this next slide will uh, show. And so it is really bad form to read off a slide, but I'm going to do that because it just may be hard for everyone to see it. So this was a statement produced uh, by um, uh, you know, uh, bishops that had, been, uh, that had convened for this council. So, as the sacred and life-giving cross is everywhere set up as a symbol, so also should the images of Jesus Christ, the Virgin Mary, the holy angels, as well as those of the saints and other pious and holy men, be embodied in the manufacture of sacred vessels, tapestries, vestments, etc., and exhibited on the walls of churches, in the homes, and in all conspicuous places, by the roadside and everywhere, to be revered by all who might see them. For the more they are contemplated, the more they move to fervent memory of their prototypes. Meaning that the prototype is going to be the actual person that is portrayed in the image. Therefore, it is proper to accord to them a fervent and reverent veneration. Not, however, the venerable uh, adoration which, according to our faith, belongs to the, to the divine being alone. For the honor accorded to the image passes over to his prototype, and whoever venerates the image venerates in it the reality of what is there represented. So, uh, so all that to say that the idea behind these images is that it is not the thing itself that is being worshipped or venerated. It is what is being represented in it. It helps us give a visual access to that in a way that some people might find helpful. Um, in Eastern Orthodox churches, uh, the walls are surrounded by icons and sometimes layers of icons. And that kind of gives us a visual representation of the communion of saints that we are surrounded by all of them in this act of worship. Um, and that kind of leads also to the idea that worship tends to be very sensory. We taste things, we smell things, we hear things, we see things. Um, they're like all the senses can be invoked in worship and sacred art uh, does that. Um, icons do that. Okay, we don't have a lot of time left, but I have one more slide I'm gonna show you. And this is probably one of the most famous icons um, that has been produced. So it's a little hard to see. Um, the light might be washing it out a bit. But this is from a Russian Orthodox monk, Andrei Rublov, uh, who died um, in the uh, you know, kind of early-ish uh, 15th century. I think it possibly a few years after this icon was completed in like 1430. And so, this is an icon called Trinity, okay? And this icon is kind of doing what I said before, that it is honestly taking elements, it's, it's showing scripture in a new way. Um, this is an image of what people take to be the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but this is depicting a moment in scripture from Genesis 18, 1 through 8, when Abraham was visited by three angels. So, 
again, we kind of have to have a sense of imagination when we read that, because, you know, if for maybe Jewish readers of that passage, there are three angels that visit. Um, if, you know, but early Christians, when they read that, there were three people, where do you think you're going to have? You're going to have the Holy Trinity in some fashion, because the, the, the angels that are shown there, they speak with one accord, they're all of the same mind, um, they, you know, kind of just act in such a similarity that there's no distinction between them. And so, uh, what early Christians did when they read that passage is they saw what's called a prefigurement of the Holy Trinity, of basically the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the Bible right there. And so what Rublov did is he took um, symbols uh, from the New Testament and from iconography itself and offered, in a sense, a reinterpretation of that passage to show um, that this is the Trinity that is being depicted in this moment in Genesis. So, again, it's a little hard to see, but this is a very famous image that you can, you know, Google it yourself and find it uh, quite easily to take a look at. What we have is on uh, the right here, uh, we have someone that's adorned in a kind of like a green uh, garb, and their head is inclined towards this person on the left. We have someone in the middle who is wearing red and blue, and their head is also inclined towards that person that's on the left. And what's being demonstrated here is a very um, um, foundational theological idea that basically the person on the left is the father. And we have the son in the middle, and we have the Holy Spirit on the other end and their heads are inclined towards the Father because uh, both proceed from the Father, that they can do nothing except what the Father accords them to do. And so this is a, a sign of the deference of the hierarchy that the Trinity has, where they are co-equal, but they are also, you know, can do nothing but what the Father says can be done. So... Um, this is where also other aspects of symbolism come in. Um, for example, this uh, uh, individual, this person on the right, on the far right, this is going to be the Holy Spirit. And we can tell that because the garment that he is wearing is, is green. And you kind of have to know about Eastern Orthodox liturgy to get this, but in the West, the Holy Spirit tends to be portrayed or depicted in terms of the color red. At, at an ordination or at confirmation, um, clergy or vestments, things like that, paraments will be red to show the dynamic you know, power, the nature of the Holy Spirit. But with the Orthodox, the Holy Spirit is depicted as green, uh, that color, because they're emphasizing the vibrant, life-giving nature of the Holy Spirit. And even on Pentecost, when you walk into an Orthodox church, it might be completely filled up and adorned with, uh, with actual greenery, with, you know, trees, branches, leaves, things like that. So, next, in the middle, is going to be the sun. And uh, that's, it's, we can tell that this is intended to be an image of Jesus Christ because any image of Jesus um, that is not maybe crucifixion, or maybe post-resurrection, uh, Jesus is wearing red to emphasize the humanity, and then he's also wearing blue to emphasize divinity. And you can see that also with the Holy Spirit wearing blue as well. And then next, we have the Father. The Father, if you were able to see a good image of it, doesn't really have a clear color. There's blue, but there's also shimmering brilliance coming out of it. And that's because what's being emphasized here, and really with all of them, is a sense of like light or glory emanating from every person of the Holy Trinity. And so because of that, the Father's colors are indistinguishable because the Father embodies everything. And so there's no clear way to try to show that except for to just show light in any way you can, stemming from that person itself. Um, let's see, what time? Okay, we probably 
have to wrap this up um, because it is now five till. But, but yeah, this, this went fast. And this is something that could take hours to talk about. But are there any, um, I would love to keep talking about this, but are there any maybe last comments or questions? Um, anything that we can say to wrap this up? I will say this, that in the way that sacred music, the way that statues or um, stained glass does for aids in worship, um, what icons do is they provide a sense of presence. They provide a sense of immediacy in the way that we might look at a photograph of a loved one. That's the way we think of the saints as well, that they are there somewhere, that they are present in some way. And the images that we surround ourselves with um, can help convey that reality as well. And so, you know, we have an icon of St. Paul that's at the very back of the church. When you're walking out, it may obstruct things to try to do prostrations in front of it, but you can, you can look at it. You can say a prayer. You can say, St. Paul, pray for me. St. Paul, pray for us. You can, you can use that as a tool to, you know, again, not worship an image that's on wood that's been, you know, portrayed by paint, but you can think about the incarnation, the fact that Jesus Christ joined himself to creation in such a dynamic way that everything has been changed by it. Every aspect of creation has been changed by it. And because of that, these sacred images, you know, portray worship in that way for us too, that they help us see that sacred reality of the incarnation in a way that may not always be apparent. Okay.